Praise God. Aren't you glad that we're gathered in the house of the Lord and Jesus is here, amen? And uh, he promised to be here. And I thank God and I believe that he is here. I believe with all my heart that the presence of God is in this room. I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Exodus 33, verse 14 and 15. Exodus 33, verse 14 and 15. Let's stand for reading of God's word. Moses is called to an impossible job, and it is a hard task that he has. But because God is with him, then Moses can achieve it. It will be possible because God is in it. And I want you to know that no matter the difficulty, if God is in it, it is possible. Because with God, all things are possible. And we need his presence in our life. And Moses says to God, I am weary, I'm drained, I, I don't know if I can do the job. And in verse 14 of Exodus 33, God speaks to Moses and he says, and God said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And Moses said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. In other words, God, if you don't go, I don't go. I refuse to be a partaker of anything that you're not in control of. I refuse to do anything that you are not involved in. And I want you to know that it's very important that we understand that the best way to be in God's will is to get where he is and follow him instead of trying to talk him into coming where you are. We need to go to where he is. And Moses said, I'm not going where you tell me to go unless you are with me, your presence is with me. Now, I have a little different type message tonight, and I want to use for a subject tonight, enemies of prayer. You may be seated. Enemies of prayer. Now, when we think of the presence of God, we think of the Holy Spirit. When we think of God's presence, we, presence, we think of the Bible. We think of God's Word. When we think of the presence of God, we think of Jesus being with us and in this room. I believe also when we think of the presence of God, we think of prayer. But prayer is very much misunderstood in our day because you can be a prayer and still not know God. You can be a person of prayer and still not know the strength and the mercy and the grace of God. Prayer is a religious exercise without the breath of God if Jesus Christ and the truth is not embedded in it. Jesus Christ said to the woman at Jacob's well in verse 24 of John 4, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I want to say the spirit and truth will produce real prayer. Real prayer comes from a genuine, born-again child of God. You say, well, don't sinners pray? If they do and they pray from the heart, they're not sinners anymore. If a lost man prays and he prays from the heart and he prays with the true knowledge of who God is, then he gets born again. And the best way to have the presence of God in your life is to be born again. That guarantees you God going with you wherever he calls you to do because God will never leave you nor forsake you. I thank God for salvation. I thank God in this day of, of upheaving, this day of uncertainty, I thank God for salvation. I thank God for the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of glory and no matter what happens around me, 
through my pathway and in my way. Jesus is Lord and sovereign God over everything that I might approach in life. Jesus truly is the presence of God. I rejoice in the Bible because it is the presence of God as well. I shout over the fact that the Spirit of God can be felt in this room for it is the presence of God. I rejoice that Jesus is among us for he is Emmanuel, God with us. But I want you to know that prayer, if prayer has been connected to the Spirit and truth, it becomes real prayer. God said that he is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm glad for the presence of salvation. In this body right now is the presence of salvation. And because Jesus lives in me, and as you as a child of God, you being a born again child of God, because Jesus lives in you and you have salvation, you can say everything's okie dokie. Everything's okay. Makes no difference what happens. And I want you to know that there is a silence about our heart that can only be described by the peace and the presence of God. I love a scripture found in Zephaniah. It talks about the silence of his presence. In Zephaniah chapter one, verse seven, it says, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, and he had bid his guest. Had you caught that verse, how incredible it is? It says the day of the Lord is at hand. And I believe the day of the Lord is at hand. I believe this thing is about to come unraveled and we're about to be caught up. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is at the door. I believe that he's very close. I believe that he's uh, gonna come quickly, rapidly, and any moment. I believe that. I sense that in my heart. My heart skips a beat when I think about the fact that God's coming, and he's not coming to beat me up. He's coming to take me up. He's not coming to tear me apart. He's coming to bring me together in the unity of the faith and love Jesus and walk in the things of God. But when God comes, judgment comes upon the earth. There's an upheaval even in the land. There's death everywhere we turn. There's, there's, there's adversity and there's trials and there's storms. And the Bible says in this verse seven of Zephaniah chapter one that the, the, the peace of the presence, hold thy peace at the presence of God. He says don't worry at the presence of God. He said don't chew your fingernails at the presence of God. Don't get upset and uptight at the presence of God for the day of the Lord is at hand. Of course it is. God's coming soon. But but he says, I want you to understand the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and had bid his guests. And I want you to know the Lord has prepared a sacrifice for you and I. And that sacrifice is the bloody cross of Calvary, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary. And God prepared himself a lamb and died on the cross of Calvary. On Golgotha's hill, the, the, the devil was annihilated. On Golgotha's hill, the devil was destroyed, his power was stripped because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and did not stay dead but got up and is alive today. Jesus lives, he lives, he lives. Mark it down, Jesus Christ is alive and the same body that died on that cross on Calvary and that same body that was wrapped in a linen cloth and a burial shroud that was put in the tomb, that same body came out of the grave three days and three nights later and ascended back to heaven on high and there's a man, Christ Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father and Jesus Christ is making intercession for you and I. He is alive, he is alive, he is alive, he is alive. And not only is Jesus alive in heaven, Jesus is alive right in here. Not only is Jesus alive up there in heaven, he's alive in every born again Christian in this room. Christ lives in you. Chuck, Christ lives in you again. Uh, uh, Ward Christ lives in you again. Uh, uh, Don Christ lives in you again. I want you to know he lives, he lives, he lives. He lives in Chuck, he lives in Josh, he lives in Don, he lives in Daryl, he lives in, in Ward, he lives in Bob, and I could 
go on and name all of you by first name. He lives in you. He lives in you. He's the resurrected one. Did you know that you've got a living God, not a dead God that lives in your bosom if you're a child of God? And the Bible says that if you have the presence of God, the Bible says if you have the presence of his salvation, he said, just be silent. Just take it easy. Don't get upset. Don't get out of, don't get out of joint. He said, hold thy peace. Uh, don't get upset. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord because God is inside and nothing can happen to you and I. I am and you as a Christian, you are indestructible. A bomb could go off in this room right now. Uh, an atomic bomb could explode and, and, and blow to smithereens this building and nothing but little splinters everywhere. This place could be totally burned and, and melted down by a nuclear blast and nothing but a hole in the, in, in the bottom of this uh, hillside and this hillside could be exploded, the heavens torn apart, but there you are living on because Christ is in you. Christ lives in you. You cannot die. You will not die because the resurrected Lord of glory lives inside of you. That's the peace of salvation. And that is the reason God said, be silent at my presence. It's gonna be all right. Don't you cry. Don't you fret. Don't you worry. Don't you get upset. Just hold your peace. Just take it easy. Just calm down. It's gonna be all right. Don't know what I'm gonna do. Doesn't matter. We know what Jesus did. And we know what Jesus is gonna do. Are you listening to me? Thank God for the fact that Jesus can connected us together with prayer, true prayer, and we know that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The spirit has come to my life and changed me forever. The truth has come into my heart and changed you and I forever. The truth has come into your heart and changed you forever. Aren't you glad for the presence of God? Come on now, I'm preaching better than your response. Can I get a witness in this house? Can I get a witness in this house? Not only, not only that, there is the, God has prepared a sacrifice. I gotta go back to that. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. Woo, praise the Lord. Hey, listen to me. Let me dangle and, and get some yodeling out. Hey, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. Let me clear my throat and tell the world that God has prepared you and I a sacrifice and God has bid and God has, has, has given the invitation to guest. Our position in his presence. Standing in his presence. Our position in his presence. You say, what's that got to do with prayer? I'll get to it in just a moment. Standing in his presence, Second Chronicles 20, verse 9. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, is being intimidated and, and they bring in a threatening war against uh, Jehoshaphat, Moab, and Ammonites. And Jehoshaphat doesn't know what to do, but in his cry out to God and in his stand, because Moab and Ammon is coming against him, Jehoshaphat said in verse 9 of 2 Chronicles 20, it says, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, parenthesis, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, thou wilt hear and help. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Isn't that a beautiful verse? God, I don't know what to do. Judah doesn't know what to do. We're in a mess, but we're gonna stand right here at the house of God because your name is here at the house of God. We're not moving. We're gonna call out to you. Prayer is going to be our resource to connect. And I want you to know that there's many ways to connect with God as far as your Bible study, you're uh, worshiping God, you're singing, you're loving God, the Spirit of God, the name of Jesus, but when you think of connecting with God, don't you automatically go to the fact, yep, on my knees, gonna talk to God, right? 
If you want to connect with God, you're going to go on your knees to talk to God. Amen? And that's what, that's what uh, uh, the king said uh, about the, the coming attack there in Second Chronicles. He said, we're going to stand in the house where the name of Jehovah is. And there Jehoshaphat says, we're going to be there. And we're going to take our stand at the house of God because the name of the Lord is there. Now, prayer is incredible. And let me say once again, the spirit and truth will produce real prayer. Let me say that again. The spirit and truth produces real prayer. There's a whole lot of, pardon the pun, fake prayer out there. You didn't get it, did you? Now, I just want to say, there's a whole lot of prayer out there that they, they, they're not going to get anywhere. A lost man's not going to get anywhere praying to God. Person that don't know the truth, person that don't worship God in spirit and truth, they're not going to get anywhere with God. But thank God I've got the spirit in me that cries, Abba, Father. And there's a spirit in me crying out to God, and I believe God answers prayer. And I believe prayer is a connect for you and I. Prayer is so powerful. I said prayer is so powerful. And I believe the devil tries to fight our prayer life. How many in this room would agree that the devil tries to fight your prayer life? And I'm going to show you a few things. I want to first of all say, now there are six terrible weapons that Satan uses. Six horrible, terrifying weapons that Satan uses to clip the prayer wings of God's children. There are things that will hurt us. And first of all, I want to say, uh, number one, or I'll give you the last one in just a minute, but number one, I want to say there is what you call fatigue. The devil is just trying to wear out the saints. And we need the presence of the Lord. How many in this room ever had the devil just try to wear you out? Amen. Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that hath no might, he increases strength. But fatigue is a real thing. Isaiah 40 verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him, speaking of Jesus, that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Fatigue. The devil will use fatigue. He'll use the weariness of your spirit. He'll discourage you. He'll bring you to a place where you feel unworthy. You feel uh, weary of trying to serve God. You say, I've, tr I've, I've worked and I've struggled and I'm just not where I need to be. You need to be re-energized with the Spirit of God. You need to be birthed by the power of God in your mind to pray again, to stir yourself to pray again. Because Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that had no might, he increases strength. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How I many would like to have some renewing of strength? Yeah. Hebrews 12, 3 says, consider him. Consider him. Consider Jesus Christ. In this, in this uh, 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 journey, in this uh, uh, labor that we're doing, consider him. Look what Jesus endured. Look what Jesus went through. We're to run this race with patience as it's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Sometimes I just need to come to church and say, wow, Jesus is incredible. You know, I don't, I don't want to go to church and hear some preacher get up and say, oh, it's just been a rough day and I'm just being beat up and I'm just so tired, don't know what I'm going to do. No, no, I don't need to hear a preacher say that. I know that I feel that way. I know that you feel that way, but I'm not going to advertise. I want to come to church and, and lift my voice and say, God is incredible. <laughs> Amen. Consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. 
lest you be weary in or faint in your minds. Isn't that just like the devil? He tries to mess with our minds. He just wears us out. Now, he can't wear me out in my heart because greater is he that's in there than he is in the world. He can't wear me out as far as my salvation. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. But he can sure mess with my head. Come to think of it, the devil ain't the only thing that messes with my head. People sometimes mess with my head. Sometimes my head messes with my head. Hello? Sometimes, you know, it's sad, but you know, it's kind of like the vacuum salesman that's gonna sell a vacuum and he's pumped himself up in the meeting and man, I can sell a hundred of these in two days. And you know, he's ready to sell the vacuum and he's going to the door and as, before he gets to the first door, he knocks on the door and the woman comes to the door, he looks at her, he gets terrified because he's been thinking the wrong thing, and he said, you won't buy this vacuum anyway. So you're not interested in that, I'm just gonna leave, I'm sorry ma'am, wasting your time, and he walks off in total defeat. Amen? But a guy that's renewed by the spirit of his mind, a guy that ain't messed with his mind, he'll knock on the door, and when the woman opens at the vacuum salesman, he'll be stuck to the door, and he'll just swing inside. And he'll tell her, I've got a vacuum. I don't want it. He'll tell the man of the house, the woman, I don't want it. And he'll pull out this handkerchief to wipe his eyes, but really he's got a bunch of dirt in it. And he pulls it out of his pocket, and dirt goes all over the car. He says, I'm so sorry. Let me show you how this vacuum cleaner works. So he's on a roll. And, and Judy used to do that. This is where I learned all this stuff. And, uh, and uh, he'll start vacuuming. He'll say, he'll say, do you like rock and roll? No, I don't like rock and roll. Well, do you like country music? No, I don't like country. He said, well, do you like Christian? Yeah, I like Christian music. He said, this vacuum will hum amazing grace. Now, the world knows that you're not gonna achieve anything with your mind blown. Amen? And God is trying to tell us to renew our mind, look to Jesus, be encouraged in the things of God, and don't be weary in your mind. Don't be destroyed in your head before you get there. Don't allow Satan to say to you, you'll never be anything, you'll never amount to anything. Luke. Uh, 18 verse one, Jesus Christ said men ought always to pray and not faint. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, you know, you know what really gets things working right? Uh, Joshua, he'll tune his guitar. And he'll get in the office and he'll put new strings on it, twing, 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 and, he, and it sounds horrible. <laughs> Tuning the guitar, sounds horrible. Ward does the same thing. Ward cannot tune his guitar where it sounds pretty. It's hideous. I said it's hideous, it's loathsome. But once he gets it tuned, he can play, woo, he can play. Same way with Josh. Same way with all you guitar players in here. Boy, you can play. Dan got a hold of that in drums. And let me tell you what, Dan, you still got the touch. That's good playing. And I want you to know this. I heard Caleb and Gunner play it the other day, and they didn't even come close to Dan. <laughs> Dan just blowed them plumb out of the water. Now, you know, I'm a little partial to Caleb, but it was bad. I'm partial to Gunner, but it was hideous. Hold their ears. Then the back, they sleep. Cool. See, the Lord's give me grace. <laughs> but not only do we have fatigue and we, the, the, you know, the devil tries to mess up our prayer life with fatigue. Some, uh, here's another way, man. And you say, what's this got to do with the presence of the Lord? You got to keep things functioning properly if you expect God to keep his presence in your life. 
I, I've mentioned many times here at the church, come early, three o'clock in the morning, pray for, you know, till eight o'clock in the morning. And, and many times I don't come here as early as I used to uh, before my wreck, I did. And many times I'd see the glory cloud. The other night, I woke up in the middle of the night and the glory cloud was in my bedroom. She said, was it because you were praying? No, it was because she was. I mean, listen to me. The way I see it, if she'll pray like that, I can retire. But anyway. <laughs> but, you know, we, I shouldn't have said that, but I did. Anyway. And uh, we, we get fatigued. And then there is distractions. The devil uses, number two, distractions. To, it's an enemy of prayer. Distraction is an enemy of prayer. You ever got distracted? You're unable to concentrate. Other thoughts are constantly bombarding your mind. Coming into your mind, things are coming into your mind, you're distracted. You ladies can get ready to pray, and when you start praying around the house, you see every corner that needs to be swept. Do you see every dish that needs to be cleaned? Because the devil would rather have you sweeping the floors than talking to God. The devil would rather have you cleaning the house than cleaning your soul and washing your heart out in prayer to God. Same goes for the man. Man, I see a thousand things to do. Not Josh. When I'm driving my car, I'll see some dirt or, or see a cup or a piece of trash, and I remove it. I'll pull in somewhere and get it out, put it in the trash can, because I like a clean car. I got in Josh's car, and honest to God, I was baptized in old plastic water jugs. I never heard such a noise in my life when I got in this car. I'm a little clumsy because of my accident, and I got in this car, and I can't believe it. It was two feet deep in water bottles. Well, that's exaggeration a little bit. So Josh don't have any distractions at all, but I do. <laughs> have you ever went to God to pray and things would get you distracted? You get distracted. That happens in church too, by the way. The cell phone rings, distracted. You gotta go back there in the back and hang around the lobby a little bit. Distraction. Baby cries, thank God babies are healthy enough to cry. But when a baby cries, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with it. Just, you know, if a baby starts crying in the church, just look up here, just look up here, don't let, a noise distract you. Come on. Don't let anything distract you. Because the devil will try to distract you. And he certainly will do it in your prayer life. Distractions. That's an enemy of prayer. Being distracted. Look at Psalm 55 verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Number two, or number three rather, here's another enemy of prayer. Inner restlessness. Inside restlessness. It'll grip you. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, cast thy burden upon the Lord, he shall sustain thee, he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I want you to know that inner restlessness should not be allowed in our prayer life. We need to remember, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. You know, there's a lot of people out there that believe in God, and they're miserable. But that other part of that verse, believe also in me, Jesus said, makes all the difference in the world. 
Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And there's a restlessness in people's lives many times. Something going on inside. They can't seem to let it go. And that uh, hinder your prayer life. You got to press in. Come on. I'm about done, but I want you to listen to this. This is important that you see this. Not only is fatigue an enemy of prayer, distraction an enemy of prayer, inner restlessness an enemy of prayer, but haste. Haste. Too big a hurry to pray. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 8, 3 says. Be not hasty to go out of his sight, speaking of the king. Stand not in the evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever he pleases. What does, who does it whatsoever he pleases? The king does. And the Bible says that when you got the ear of the king, don't be too hasty to leave his presence. Be not hasty to go out of the sight of the king. I believe what he's saying is we need to pray and stay in prayer until we get our attention. See, I got you. I got you. You thought I was going to say pray and pray until you get God's attention. God's not the one having problems. Amen. I might as well put lead in that balloon. It ain't going nowhere. But we need to pray until we get our attention. I think many times we pray and just stop short of God having a breakthrough. I think there's times we pray and we just move too quick. And we're too hasty to get gone or too hasty to get, to get away. And the Bible's very clear. Be not hasty. Stay in prayer. Spend some time in prayer. Talk to God. You say, well, I run out of words to say. Just stay there. You don't have to be talking all the time. Unless you're a preacher and these other preachers. But anyway, did you know prayer could be just you sitting in one place waiting for God to answer? You'd be amazed how much silence tunes the chords of your heart to staying in the presence of the Lord. Don't be too hasty to get out of his sight. Don't be too hasty to get away from the king. Stand not in an evil thing, for the king does whatever he wants to. Here's another weapon that the devil uses to clip the prayer wings of God's children. Despair. Despair. Did you know some people get in such despair, they, they need others to pray for them? Don't sing that, ain't you? Despair. You say, well, despair will drive you to God. Sometimes it, it drives you totally out of your mind, your senses. We, you know, despair will cause people to not look far enough ahead. You need to look ahead. If you could get a man that's about to commit suicide to look ahead, he'd never do it. If you could get a teenager, a child, and you know, I was shocked. They said that one of the main causes of death with children now is suicide. I was shocked when I heard that report on the news. But if you can get them to just look ahead, it'll pass. Everything changes. Amen? And despair comes. And we need to understand that that despair many times comes in the form of trying to keep us from looking ahead. All we can see is the problem around us. Look at Isaiah 35, verse 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. That's uh, talking about a runner. A runner's knees are weak. He raises his hand before he crosses the finish line in victory. 
strengthen the feeble knees. We see the same thing in Hebrews 12, 12. Wherefore, lift up your hands which hang down and the feeble knees. The last one, I said six things that are enemies of prayer. Fatigue, distraction, inner restlessness, haste, despair. And the last one is fleshly, fleshly hungers is a distraction from prayer. Amen. And the twing, twing. I'm kidding. But anything, anything that will distract you. I'm not asking you to come to this altar tonight and pray for three hours. But I'm going to encourage you tonight as a child of God to go somewhere, leave your phone in the car. Or if you're going in the car, leave it at the house. Go somewhere without your phone. Go somewhere, tell somebody where you're going to be. Go somewhere without any distractions and spend some quality time with Jesus Christ. That's important. Stand with me. Glad you came tonight? Yeah. Let me just stay in prayer. Just stay in the presence. Remember what, remember what Moses said to God? If you don't go, I ain't going. Remember what it said in our text? The presence, God said, I will send my presence with you. I will go with you. The angel will go with you. And I want you to know God will go with us. And one of those tools that we have at our grasp is prayer. It's prayer. Spend time in prayer. Spend time talking to God. Altars open as they play and sing.